Okay. No, no. So, um, okay, welcome everybody. According to my German-made watch, it is uh, nine o'clock. Um, so one uh, quick thing before I start. Uh, in these three lectures, I find that I don't have enough time to go over all the things that I want, so I've tried to make uh, judicious selection so that the things that I do cover will hopefully be comprehensible in this last lecture. Um, but I do want to make myself available if there are any additional questions, things we don't have time for. And the only possibility that works for me is uh, from 5 to 6 today. So I'll just be in this room. I'll be available. It's obviously not required. I'm not going to lecture anymore, I promise. But uh, I'll be happy to go over anything that was unclear if anybody wants to come. Okay? Okay, so now uh, I know that nothing thrills the heart of a student as much as walking in and seeing a blackboards full of equations, right? Uh, so I, I, I have to plead a little bit guilty. Most of them are things that we've seen before, except for all those equations up there. I just wanted to save some writing, but uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll forgive me, OK? So here I am going to review where we were last time, where we got to regarding the A theorem, OK? Um, <clears throat> So remember what the idea here was. The idea is exactly the same setup that we used to prove the asymptotics of, of uh, perturbative of RG flows at asymptote to perturbation theory. Uh, we consider whatever quantum field theory we're interested in studying, QCD or whatever, we put it in an arbitrary background metric, and we think about computing this generating function, right? This, the, the quantum effective action, if you like. And we consider a very specific background, namely a conformally flat background, where the conformal factor uh, obeys this equation of motion. Okay? And now, instead, what we're considering is a special kind of RG flow that starts in the UV as a CFT and goes to the infrared as a CFT. We just finished arguing that, that we, that's a highly generic situation. It's the only possible situation if the asymptotics is described in perturbation theory. Okay? Now, the intuition is that because this uh, conformal factor represents a local scale transformation, this, this conformal factor, which we can think of as a dilaton, this being an on-shell condition, that this on-shell dilaton should decouple when we have a conformal field theory, and therefore it should decouple in the UV and the IR. The precise statement of that decoupling is the following thing. If we have a CFT, if this W asymptotes to something that's a CFT, then we get uh, the non-local piece of W is independent of omega, but there is a local piece that has a very specific dependence on omega, which is dictated by this anomaly A. Okay? And so A is an anomaly coefficient. If I know how to solve the CFT, I know how to calculate A just within the CFT. Okay? It's a quantity that you can calculate completely within the CFT. I don't need to know anything about the flow between these guys. Okay? So for example, uh, just uh, if I have a free CFT, then I should be able to calculate everything. right? And then uh, it was, oh, I forget the other, Duff and somebody, who I forget. Anyway, in the 70s already, this was calculated for free CFTs. And the answer is some, uh, there's, this is a wrong factor. There's like a 60 or something here. There's one more digit here. I forget. Anyway, there's some loop factor. And then it just counts the number of scalars, fermions, and vectors. Okay, So, uh, okay? so it's a very specific thing. Everybody agrees what it is. And it's a property of the CFT. Okay? And the A theorem, okay, was originally conjectured by John Carty in the 1980s. The A theorem asserts that in any flow whatsoever, AUV is bigger than AIR. That is the A theorem. That's what we want to prove. Okay? Any questions on that? That's the setup. That's what we're trying to do. Any questions on that? So the physical content of this statement is this is a restriction on RG flows. If I have a theory which is, say, uh, you know, if, if I have some theory in the UV and it flows to some theory in the IR, it means that this theory in the IR, there's no possible perturbation of this theory that will flow back to this theory here. There's a height function on the space of all theories, all four-dimensional theories, which is given by A. And you always go down by RG flow.
That's what, that's what everybody wants to say. Uh, I, don't, I think that, that, uh, that interpretation is actually bogus, but, uh, but a lot of people will say what you just said. Okay? But I don't want to explain that right now. I'll be happy to discuss that in more detail during the question, if you want to come to the question period, or just catch me whenever. Okay? All right? But yeah, that's what most people would say. I think that's, that's totally bogus. Okay? All right. Um, okay, so now, uh, how are we going to prove this? We're going to prove this using exactly the same ideas, the very similar set of ideas that we use to prove the asymptotics of the RG flow before. Namely, we consider this amplitude, which we can think of as uh, an amplitude of four of these dilettons, right, where the momenta flowing in are on shell. Okay, so that's given by, as usual, taking four derivatives with respect to this field pi. Pi is just turning this omega into a physical field, expanding around omega equals one. And the, uh, by dimensional analysis, it has this sort of form here, where alpha is a dimensionless function of s. Okay? Right? And, as we had before, the analyticity properties of this function are that it has cuts all along the real axis, okay? And just as before, we're going to consider the same Cauchy integral of s, okay? It goes from SIR to SUV, exactly the same thing that we did before, okay? And then we find this relation that alpha bar IR, sorry, alpha bar of SIR uh, minus alpha bar of SUV I think I want uv minus ir. Equals 2 over pi times the integral from suv, sir, to suv, ds, alpha of s over s. OK? Where this alpha bars, these alpha bars are the integrals over these semicircles. And this piece right here, sorry, it's imaginary part, very important, imaginary part of alpha of s. And this imaginary part comes from the integral from over here and here. Okay? It's the imaginary part because of the an various analyticity properties of the amplitude. Okay? Any questions on this? Yes? Why did I choose these semicircles? Yeah, yeah. Because it works. Because you'll see the argument works. Of course, I could choose this contour, but I wouldn't learn anything. That's exactly what I'm going to do next, because the next thing I'm going to do, sorry, OK, so the next thing I'm going to do, this is just true for any SUV and any SIR. Now I want to take the limit as SUV goes to infinity and SIR goes to 0. OK? That's exactly what I want to do, OK? Um, but just hold, OK, I'm getting there, all right? But then the important point is that this piece is positive, right? Because it's the imaginary part of a forward amplitude. By the optical theorem, it's positive, OK? Now, the next thing, the, so to, to what I want to prove now is that, in fact, alpha bar of s goes to minus 4, I guess I want ir minus uv. I guess I do want this. Sorry. <laughs> okay. There's a minus for a, that's what I had in my notes, so I'm, I'm, I'm not being, I was being dishonest before, now I'm being honest. Okay. Okay. That alpha bar of s just goes to minus 4a, okay, in either the uv or the ir limit. So it goes to the uv a or the ir a, depending on which limit I'm taking. Okay? Right? UV is s going to infinity, IR is s going to zero. Okay? Remember that before, uh, I used a very, I argued before that alpha bar of, let's say, SIR should be something calculable in terms of the low energy effective theory, right? As SIR goes to zero. Now I'm telling you that if the IR effective theory is a, as a CFT, I know that it's exactly given by A, right? That's this argument over, well, OK. It's not quite this argument over there. But the point is, is that uh, when this circle gets smaller and smaller, the effective action is more and more given by this. And I can just compute this thing. This thing gives me uh, a singularity here that I can compute, OK? 
Now, the, the, thir the only piece, so if, if that is true, OK, that immediately implies the A theorem. That is the A theorem, right? OK, QED question mark. OK, the only thing I need to check is I need to check, so sorry, so to, 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 to check this thing, right, uh, this is true if this piece right here dominates. OK, that's true if this piece right there dominates, OK? Uh, to check whether it, how do I check whether it dominates? Okay, let's take for example in the infrared. Why why does that term actually dominate? Well, the idea is in the infrared. Okay, I can think about some effective Lagrangian, right? Which is the Lagrangian for the IR CFT, whatever that is. Okay, right? Plus what? So if this theory flows to the uh, to the to the um, to this fixed point, then it has to be equal to the IRCFT plus some irrelevant operators. So I'll have some scale m, okay, minus uh, to some power times some operator like this. So the, the idea is that the dimension of this operator is delta IR, okay, plus higher order terms. In other words, the theory is a CFT up to irrelevant operators, right? Irrelevant operators means this dimension delta IR is bigger than four. OK? So then I can ask, how big of a correction does this, uh, dimension, does this irrelevant operator make to alpha? OK? So I can easily check that alpha of s is equal to this minus 4 a i r, right? That's, what it get, that's what's given by this piece right here, OK? And then just by dimensional analysis, OK, what I can check is that the other, this next piece right here will give me m to the square root s times some positive power right here, OK? In other words, this is saying that because the low energy theory is a CFT plus irrelevant interactions, the effects of these irrelevant interactions are suppressed. Um, sorry, it's the other way around, right? No, no, yeah, it's the other way around, square, sorry. Square root s over m, right, to some positive power, OK? OK, so you can check, yes? This is just the piece. This is the contribution from the IRCFT. That's what I. That's the contribution from this piece right here. Okay. So what I'm saying is that the IR theory is a CFT up to irrelevant interactions. Okay. And that's enough to guarantee that this alpha s really does. It really is dominated by this term. Okay. What, what yeah. Alpha? Sorry. Go ahead. Ru, go ahead. Isn't it just by definition that uh, when you go to zero? Yes. Well, I demonstrated it. But if it's obvious to you, that's OK with me. OK? Well, as a good exercise, I would say compute what this power is. If that's obvious to you, then that's fine. OK? For an arbitrary delta IR, and it should be something that changes sign when delta IR equals 4, right? Ah, by definition, because otherwise I would not flow to this theory, right? So maybe I had to, maybe there are some relevant operators in the theory and I tuned them to zero, right? But I, I did whatever I had to do to get the theory to flow into this IR fixed point. That was the assumption. It doesn't, I'm not saying that there are no other IR operators in the theory, but there are no other IR operators in the Lagrangian. Okay, sorry, another question? Yeah. There are no relevant operators in the Lagrangian at low energies. Otherwise, we wouldn't flow to the fixed point. Yeah. That's another good exercise. You can ask, what happens if there are marginal operators here? OK, then the decoupling is marginal. And you can show that it still works. OK, I won't show that. But yes, that's a good question. It's enough for the operators to actually decouple logarithmically in the infrared. OK? And the same is true for the UV. OK? All right? A lot, the, so the, the reference for this right here, the original reference is Kamergodsky and Schwimmer, 2011. Um, there's a paper by myself, uh, Ricardo Rotazzi, and Joe Polchinski, where a lot of these questions, for example, this decoupling is discussed in more detail. 
Okay, there's also a paper by Kamargadsky alone on perturbative RG flows, which is very good. Okay, so if you want to learn more about this. Okay. So that, yes, sorry. Yes. But I'm not going to do it. I'll be happy to discuss it. But yes, it's even simpler. It's one of many topics that would have been nice to have time to discuss. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to skip uh, talking about whether what we know about scale versus conformal invariance in non perturbative theories because of time. Okay, and uh, I've got one hour left, and I'm going to, in one hour, I'm going to try to do some justice to the vast field of conformal field theory, which is impossible. But I will do my best, okay? I will try to select judiciously, okay? So let's remind ourselves of where we were uh, near the, uh, somewhere in lecture one, okay? We discovered that if we have a vanishing trace of the energy momentum tensor, then we necessarily have these space-time symmetries, right? Um, here are the usual Poincaré transformations. These, are, these should be familiar. Here are uh, scale transformations. They are less familiar, but quite intuitive. And then we have these things, which are, what are these things? We don't, we don't know. We just give them a name for now. We call them special conformal transformations. Okay. So what I'm going to spend the rest of uh, my, my time on is trying to give you an introduction to the physics of theories where this is the set of symmetries that we have. Okay. Now, we're going to be switching gears a bit here. Instead of working in Minkowski space, we're going to be working in the Euclidean theory. So that means instead of SO d comma 1, d minus 1 comma 1 symmetry in d space time dimensions, we have SOD. Okay, we have rotation invariance. Okay, and we're also going to be working in position space, okay, which you might not like, but that's what we're going to do. Okay. Now, the first step in trying to get some understanding of what the physics of this is, is to try and understand a little bit better what are these special conformal transformations. Okay? And it, what it can be shown, and this is one of the things that I'm, you know, like I said, I'm leaving things out, hopefully judiciously. Okay? Um, it can be shown that what the finite version of this transformation looks like, okay, is uh, like this. Okay, this is so the the thing that's parameterized by b mu when I exponentiate this thing, okay, uh, you can show that this is the kind of transformation that you get. So this formula may not look very enlightening to you, okay? But I claim that it actually is something that you know, okay? So let's understand the geometry of this. Remember, we're now in d-dimensional Euclidean space, okay? So b mu is a vector, so it points in some direction, which I, without loss of generality, can be the up direction. And then a vector always defines a plane perpendicular to it, which is some r d minus 1, okay? Now you can check quite easily that what happens to any plane like this is it gets mapped into a sphere, S d minus 1. Okay? And in fact, this uh, kind of projection, you can understand what it is geometrically by, uh, this is actually a stereographic projection. So if you have ever seen a map projected onto a, a flat piece of paper, which I, I hope you have, um, then uh, the way that these maps are made is that you have the Earth, which is a globe, then you have some plane down below, and then you take any point on the Earth, for example, this point right here, and you just project it, oops, right? You just project it down onto the plane by a straight line, okay? And you can check that this formula is actually a higher dimensional version of this. Notice that where you put the plane, you'll get a different stereographic projection. Just like over here, if you choose a different plane, say that one, you will get a different sphere. Turns out they always touch at one point. Okay? But that gives you an idea 
of what these things are. They are essentially stereographic projections. And if you think about it, you know that stereographic projections are conformal transformations, because what are conformal transformations? Well, these are things that rescale the metric by a constant, and that constant depends on the position, right? So what's happening under a conformal transformation is that the metric is being mapped to some local scale factor times the original metric. So it's stretching distances in some crazy way, right? But what it preserves is angles, because angles are independent of the scale factor, right? And when you look at a globe projection, you know that there are all these lines, and these lines are perpendicular. And then if you look at the image of the globe down here, you notice that all these lines are perpendicular here. So these maps have the property that all angles are preserved. And that's an obviously a useful thing if you're trying to sail a boat across an ocean or something, right? OK, so that's why. So there's actually, yeah. So anyway, so conformal transformations are very useful in, in, in map making. OK, so you have actually seen this before. It's a very good exercise for you to verify that this stereographic projection is given by a formula like this. Okay, find out what b is as a function of where you put the plane. Yes? We're in Euclidean space, so our metric in flat space, instead of being eta mu nu, it's the Kronecker delta. And then the isometry group of Euclidean space is not SOD minus 1 comma 1, it is SOD. OK, that's all I meant to say. OK? All right? So now, so now you know, at least have some idea of what these transformations are geometrically. OK, so these are funny. Uh, um, OK, so you know what they are geometrically. Now, what we want to do is we want to implement these symmetries in quantum field theory, right? And what we showed in the first lecture is that these guys each correspond to some isometry, right? And each isometry has a generator. And we know that there's an algebra of these guys. So we can define a charge, Q. And this Q has some isometry, right? Sorry, has some commutation relation, right? right? These Qs do. Okay? And again, something I have to leave out because I need to get to, you know, I need to try to hit the highlights is that how do you work out this algebra? It's a, it's a fairly straightforward thing, but you can work out this algebra. Okay? And the answer is pada. Okay? Now, let's not try to focus on every last index and sign, but let me kind of walk you through this. Okay? Because, uh, uh, let, okay. All right? So, first of all, this part right here, you already know. This is the Poincare algebra. Right? The Poincare algebra has p mu, which generates translations, and m mu nu that, translate, that, that, uh, that generates Lorentz transformations, or SOD. So I'm going to sometimes call SOD Lorentz transformations, okay? just to kind of, that's the role that they play. Right? They're the Euclidean Lorentz transformations. And so this is like the Euclidean Poincare group, okay? or this is the Euclidean group, blah, 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 whatever. Okay? Fine. Now, let's add in the dilatations, okay? just the scale transformations. So then, dilatations commute with each other. That should be pretty obvious. Dilatations change p mu to something proportional to itself. That makes sense, because it's saying that p mu has, mass, has a positive dimension, has dimension 1, basically. Okay? And then the dilatations commute with Lorentz transformations. That should be pretty obvious, because in Lorentz transformations, I'm just rotating about a point, And dilatations, I'm just scaling around a point, around the same point. Okay, So they commute. So I just want you to notice that if I just put in scale transformations in Poincare, this algebra completely closes. right? So there's no, if I just looked at this algebra, there's no need for any other generators. All the generators close. Okay? But we did, in fact, get these additional generators, the Ks. right? And so here are the commutation relations of the Ks. Okay? The Ks commute with themselves. They have some wacko commutation relation with the Ps. Okay? K with P is a com linear combination of Lorentz and dilatation. Okay? And then uh, their commutation relation with the angular momentum generators, notice that it looks just like the, angular, the commutation with P. And that's because this commutator really just expresses the fact that this is a vector operator. 
Okay, so this is, this is just an obvious statement. And then the dilatation operator with k looks a lot like p, but it has the opposite sign. Okay? So this, the, the fact that, uh, that we have this opposite sign, sorry, whoops, bup, 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 bup. yeah, this commutation relation and this, right, notice that k and p are very similar to each other, okay, uh, except for this sign here, okay, and that's going to be very important. Okay, any questions on this? Yeah. K generates these transformations that I've just talked about over here. Okay, just like P generates translations, etc. Okay. By the way, I should should have mentioned at the beginning of all of this an excellent and I mean really excellent reference for all the things that I'm talking about here and most of the things that I'm skipping is uh, Simmons Duffin's Tassie lectures from last year. So they're they're really excellent, okay? And I'm 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 copying judiciously, I hope, mainly copying judiciously from them, okay? Okay. Now uh, this algebra looks really complicated, but it's actually a lot simpler than it looks. It's actually at least more familiar than it looks. Still not going to have enough time. <laughs> okay, because I can uh, I can define some new generators J M N, where these new indices M and N run from zero one to D and D plus one. So I'm adding two new dimensions. Okay, and um, uh, I can define now j mu nu. So remember, mu and nu run from, well, okay, let me just, j mu nu is just m mu nu, where, where mu and nu just run from 1 to d, right? Those are my standard guys, okay? And then I can define j0 mu equals 1 half p mu plus k mu, and j uh, d plus 1 mu is 1 half p mu minus k mu, and then j of 0, d plus 1, is equal to d. Okay? So I've told you now what all the j's are. In fact, the j's, I should have written up here, are anti-symmetric. Okay? The j's are all anti-symmetric. So because they're anti-symmetric, I've told you what all of them are. And the claim is that what this metric, what this, these jmn's are the generators of so, uh, d plus 1 comma 1, OK? Where this right here, this is a Minkowski type. Uh, this is a Lorentz type group, right? It has one time-like direction and d plus 1 space-like directions. And the metric that it preserves is exactly the diagonal metric that has minus 1, 1, 1, 1. So here are the d original dimensions. They all are Euclidean. I've added one time-like and one space-like dimension, OK? so. You'll, we'll see later that conformal transformations look pretty complicated. And uh, the, the fact that this was SOD plus 1 comma 1, by the way, is recognized by Dirac in the 1930s. So I don't know what Dirac was doing thinking about uh, conformal symmetry in the 1930s. But anyway, he was. And so he discovered this fact. Um, so, but anyway, you would suspect that somehow keeping track of conformal invariants would be much easier if we had some sort of higher dimensional description. And that is, in fact, true. That's called the embedding space uh, formalism, which does go all the way back to Dirac. Um, and you can read about that not in uh, Simmons Duffin's lectures, but in the also very beautiful lectures by Slava Richkov, which I highly recommend. Okay, you can find both of those online. Okay. Okay. So, um, so, but anyway, we're going to ignore that. That's that's just a little piece of culture that I that I have to tell you. Okay. So we're going to ignore that, and now we're going to uh, now we're going to uh, to go on. Okay, without it. Okay. So we will give a more sort of pedestrian treatment of conformal trans conformal symmetry. Okay? So what we want to talk about first is 
operators. Okay? Operators are the heart and soul of quantum field theory. We have operators like fields or you know, products of fields and things like that. So I'm thinking about some operator O alpha of x. It's a local operator, and it's an operator in some Lorentz, transform Lorentz representation indexed by alpha. Okay? Remember, Lorentz here means SOD. Okay? Now, how do these operators transform under the conformal algebra? Okay. Well, I know how they transform under translations, right? They just transform as a derivative, okay? Right? And I know how they transform under Lorentz transformations, okay? They just transform according to some representation, which I'll call s mu nu alpha beta o of x, right? That's how they transform, okay? But it's not obvious how they transform under the Conformal transformations, right? Okay. So an exercise for you to 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 get some feeling for this is look at a free massless scalar field theory, okay, and show that in fact under dilatations, this phi of x is replaced by e to the lambda d minus two over two phi of e to the lambda x. Okay, that that is the finite form of dilatation transformations that leaves the Lagrangian for a free scalar in d dimensions invariant. Okay. Okay, where lambda is the transformation parameter. Okay. But anyway, we're not going to proceed by examples. We're going to proceed by general theory. Okay. And so let's ask ourselves, what could d o alpha of x be? What could it be? Okay. So I want to claim that the most general thing it can be, uh, we might have a lot of operators that have, uh, that have the same Lorentz structure, right? We might have an infinite number. In fact, we'll probably have an infinite number of them, right? And so I'll index those by i. So i is just there's more cop different, you know, there are many different operators that have the same Lorentz structure. Then what I claim is that the most general thing I can have is something like this, O alpha j of x. Okay, so the uh, the point is is that the the real only real content of this statement right here is that sorry, sorry, sorry of zero sorry. Okay, so if I just look at the operator at zero, okay, because it might have all kinds of derivative operators acting on it. Okay, but I'm going to specialize to what happens to the operator at zero. Okay, at zero the only thing that can happen so zero the point is that the point zero yeah sorry. Let me back up a little bit, OK? We're talking about these guys, right? Dilatations, scale transformations. Notice that the scale transformations map x equals 0 to itself, right? OK? So they can't, so acting on 0, they cannot have any derivative operators acting on the point 0, right? Because otherwise that would move the point 0. But it can't, because there's an x here, OK? Yes? That was a missing piece here. So I claim that at the, when the operator is evaluated at 0, this is the most general form of the transformation that's allowed. Okay? And this delta ij is, in principle, an infinite dimensional matrix. Could be complex. I don't know. Could be anything. Right? Now, I'm going to specialize to the case where, in fact, it's just a number. Okay? So we just have a single operator goes to delta o uh, alpha of 0. Okay? And this is not justified at this point. I'm going to justify later that this really is the most general situation. Okay? But I can't justify it yet. So for right now, logically, this is a special case. Okay? Now, the point that I want to make is that the transformation of the, uh, given this, okay, given this parameter delta, so delta is a new number, which I don't know what it is. It's whatever it is. Uh, just like uh, this Lorentz representation is whatever it is. But now given the Lorentz representation and this value of delta, the transformation of the operator uh, under the full conformal group is completely determined. Okay? And this, is, uh, uh, this was first discovered by Mack and Salam back in the I think, 70s, okay? so ancient history. So uh, and the idea is the following. Let me, for example, consider d the commutator with d uh, with an operator at x, not just at 0. 
Okay. Well, this is equal to the commutator of d with e to the p dot x, O alpha of 0, e to the minus p dot x. Okay. So in other words, knowing how the translations just translate, okay, I can write any operator at an arbitrary x as some translation of the operator at 0. Okay. Yes? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, do stop me. I'm I'm happy to write anywhere, you know, but so if you can't see something, please let me know. Okay? Okay. Um so this is just saying that okay, that O of X is a translation of, of O, okay, in formulas. But now the point is that I know how to compute the commutator of D with P's from the algebra. So just using the algebra I can work out what this is. Okay? This is a very good exercise again, and the, I'll tell you just the answer. It is x mu d by dx mu plus delta O alpha of x. Okay? Okay? And in the same way, we can work out the transformation of the, uh, with respect to the conformal generators as well. Okay, so the transformation of the conformal generators with O alpha of x. Again, I use exactly the same trick. K mu, this is e to the p dot x O alpha of 0, e to the minus p dot x. Okay, now what we can, uh, yeah, right? Okay, so again, we can use the same trick. So here, okay, notice that k with p, this is now going to be more complicated because k with p is uh, the commutator involves both m and d, right? Okay, and m acts non-trivially on this index, okay? But now, once I have one of these commutators, okay, then, uh, well, anyway, I can work this out. This is a longer exercise, okay? And the answer is more complicated. And the answer looks like this. It is uh, minus 2x mu x dot del minus x squared uh, d mu acting on O alpha of x plus 2 delta x mu O alpha of x minus 2 x nu s mu nu alpha beta O beta of x. Okay? So it is some relatively long, not terribly enlightening uh, expression. Oh, okay. So, um, right. So, hold on a second. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't talk about that. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Because I'm. I'm skipping a little bit, not judiciously enough. That's a very good question. Okay. So, uh, what I should have. What I should have said first, very important. Okay, is that. Here, when I derived that formula, I made an unjustified assumption. Okay, just like it was an so far unjustified assumption that delta was just a number. Okay, in the same way, I'm making the assumption that k mu o alpha of zero is just zero. Okay, this is absolutely not the most general allowed thing. Okay, this is at this point just an assumption. So this is a special case, and we'll see later on why this is all that I. This is the only case I really need to worry about. Okay, and this kind of an operator right here is called a primary operator. Okay, that's just a name. It'll be it'll acquire more meaning as we go on. Okay. This is not an assumption. I claim this is the most general form allowed by Lorentz invariance because basically this index just has to go for the ride. Um, so this is, but the assumption that it's diagonalizable is an assumption. Okay, and this the being zero is an assumption. Okay. So I'm looking at some special cases, and we'll see later that this is, in fact, in a sense, the general case, in a sense that we'll see. OK? All right? But now, let's have some fun. Now let's, we, we can finally now do some physics, OK? One of the basic things that you do in particle physics, I'm going to leave this up here. Um, one of the basic things that you do is you ask yourself, oh, I have some correlation function. What's the most general form that's allowed by the symmetries, right?
Okay? So let's ask what are the correlation functions of these operators. And for simplicity, I'm going to do scalar operators, and I'm going to do these primary operators, which is all that I, I know. Okay? So let's do the simplest thing. Well, the very simplest thing is that O of x, uh, the one-point functions all vanish. And that's simply because these guys have a dimension, and this is a theory with no dimensionful constants. That was easy. So the next simplest thing is to say that we have some two-point function. Okay, this is a Euclidean two-point function, remember? Okay. So let's see, what do we know about this from the symmetries? Let's start with the easiest symmetries that we know. What's the easiest symmetry? Translations. What do translations tell me? It's a function only of the difference, x minus y, right? Then the next simplest symmetry I know is Lorentz invariance, or SOD, right? That tells me it's actually a function of the square of this thing, x minus y squared, right? So it actually just depends on one scalar, OK? And then what's the next simplest thing? Scale transformations. So what do scale transformations tell us, OK? Well, now. Uh, Let's, let's remember what scale transformations are, OK? And so what scale transformations are is they tell me that o, uh, oi of x prime is equal to e to the minus lambda delta i oi of x, right? So you, you the, 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 sorry, o prime, the, the, the rescaled operator at the rescaled point is this thing times the, uh, right, and x prime is e to the lambda x. OK? So this is how things transform under scale transformations. Now, this is just a mathematical way of saying that the dimension of O is delta. OK? So what we're really saying, to use scale transformations in variance, we're just use doing dimensional analysis, right? So what is the dimension of this? What is the dimension of this? It's delta i plus delta j, right? That's not hard. So what is this? What can this, what can this function of x minus y squared be? It, there's no dimensionful constants in the theory, right? So it can only be a form some, some x cij minus x minus y squared times the average delta i plus delta j over 2. Right? That's, that's it. So we fixed the two-point functions completely already just using scale transformations up to this matrix cij. OK? Now, I'm going to keep using a notation. I'm going to use a slight abuse of notation, and I'm going to call this x minus y to the delta i plus delta j. In other words, I'm not going to square it and then take the, you know, I, oh, that's what I mean when I write this. I always mean square it and then take the, take the appropriate power. OK? Saves writing. OK, so we've already learned a lot, but we're not done yet, right? We haven't used conformal transformations, OK? Special conformal transformations. And special conformal transformations are quite a bit more complicated. Okay. So what special conformal transformations are, I remind you, are, uh, are this. <coughs> Whatever. Those are special conformal transformations. They are a very special kind of diff. Okay? And you can work out the Jacobian of these. Okay? Uh, because these are special, the Jacobian is much simpler than it has any right to be. And it's just this, the same denominator factor right here to the minus d power has a very special form. And you can also check, and I, this is just, I'm going to just tell you that this is true. Okay, I'm not going to derive it, is that you, the, the, the way that one of these primary operators, remember I'm talking about these primary operators, transforms is like this. Okay? It just transforms by changing the point to the transformed point and then multiplying by the scale factor, which involves the same delta that, uh, that, that, uh, that appeared in the dilatation thing. Okay? So you just gotta kinda take that a little bit on faith. OK? 
Okay. Now, there's another there's another thing which is uh, which one can check. Okay. So this is a very uh, good exercise to do. You might say, you know, I know how does that denominator of my two-point function, which is just involving x minus y squared, how does that transform under special conformal transformations? Yes? Primary operators. Which is for now is a special case, and you don't know why I'm only talking about that special case, but I will explain it. OK? OK, but here what I'm saying is, OK, so yes, this is for primary operators. OK, but now let's, under these finite special conformal transformations, how does that denominator transform? That's what we want to know, right? OK? And again, because these special conformal transformations are special, right, they, the answer again is much simpler than you have any right to expect. The answer is x minus y squared times a product downstairs of these denominators, one for x and one for y. OK? Again, this is an excellent exercise, OK? It really is true, but if you make one algebra mistake, you will not be true. OK? So, um, all right, so now um, you can actually see very easily now, from this identity, you can see very easily now uh, what that does if I transform both sides of this thing, right? If I transform this side, OK, I just get the, I, I get the, uh, I get a product of the same number of denominators for x and for y raised to this funny power, right? Yes? I'm doing algebra by voice, so let's see, let's see how this works out. Whereas on this side right here, what do I get? I get the product of this denominator to one funny power and the, and the, and the, and the funny denominator to some other power here, right? So these do not, in general, agree with each other. They only agree with each other when, let's see if you're following my word algebra, delta i equals delta j, right? So it is conformally invariant if and only if, so conformal invariance of the two-point function implies that delta i equals delta j, otherwise it's 0, OK? So now we can say what our, so our final result using all the symmetries of the problem, is that this two-point function is proportional to x minus y to the 2 delta i. And then there's some single function c here, which of course depends on which operator i I'm talking about, right? OK? And this is only non-zero if delta i equals delta j, right? OK? So I can just call this delta if I want. I'll just call it delta i, OK? Furthermore, in a unitary theory, this ci needs to be bigger than 0, okay? strictly bigger than 0. If it's 0, then this operator vanishes. Okay? And that means that I can always rescale the operators to set ci to 1, just by changing the, my rescaling the operators. Okay? So in a sense, the two-point functions are, once I use my freedom to rescale the operators, is completely determined function of this. Okay? Now this is actually already a pretty amazing statement, right? Because, for example, in Banks-Zaks theory, okay, I have the operator psi bar psi. In a perturbative theory, it has dimension 3 plus some anomalous dimension, which I can compute order by order in perturbation theory. But the statement is that because this theory has exact conformal invariance, the two-point function looks exactly like this, okay? which is a prediction that is, you know, true, has to be true order by order in perturbation theory. Okay? And of course, this is true in non-perturbative theories as well. It's just using symmetry. Because of unitarity. Basically, I, I don't want to, again, I have to skip some things, but uh, I can talk about actual states in Euclidean theory too, because if I take a slice of Euclidean space, I just have my normal states on that slice. And those states need to have a positive norm, and therefore, in a unitary theory, uh, there's no way this can vanish unless the operator vanishes. There's no way it can be negative either. It's a sum of positive terms. Okay. OK, now another thing we can see here if we're, being, if we're trying to look at the general properties of a general conformal field theory is that, uh, that 
it makes no sense at all for correlation functions to grow with distance. Right? That would just be nonsense, physical nonsense. So we know that these delta i should be positive, or maybe they could be zero. If we go delta, if we approach delta from zero from above, you're going to get a log, right? Okay? So that might or might not be okay. I don't, you know, but anyway, let's not dwell on it, okay? But anyway, there's, they certainly can't be arbitrarily negative or be negative, right? Okay? Now, in fact, there are stronger bounds. Okay, whose derivation, again, is one of the things that I can't, uh, don't have time to tell you about. These are called the unitarity bounds. Okay. And these were originally derived by Mac in the 1970s. Um, and they tell you that for scalars, delta has to be bigger than d minus 2 over 2. Recognize this? Free scalar, right? So the dimension has to be bigger than or equal to a free scalar. Okay, and then for a spin L operator, so an L index tensor with symmetric indices, delta has to be bigger than L over two. Okay, and you can you can there's a formula for an arbitrary Lorentz representation. Okay, and if you want to understand these, do not under any circumstances read the papers by Mac. You should read the the papers by the paper by Grinstein and Trilligator and Rothstein. Okay, there's also a very nice paper by uh, Minwala which actually talks about superconformal algebra, but he has lots of good stuff about representations of the conformal algebra as well. These are much, much later, but they are much, much more pedagogical. Spin L. This is not spinner. This is spin L. So this is a symmetric tensor with L indices completely. So, so the energy momentum tensor would be spin 2, right? Sorry, this is L plus 2. Sorry. Yes? Yeah, because basically because delta i, this is only non-zero if delta i is equal to delta j. I could put another thing here. It's zero if delta i is not equal to delta j. OK? Yeah. They're only for conformal field theories. So for example, you could have, um, oh, and these are, um, I'm sorry, also it's important that these are for primary operators. Sorry, I keep forgetting to say that. OK, these are for primary operators. Let me give you an example that violates this bound. I could take a scalar, and I could take its derivative. That's a vector that has spin 1, that has dimension 3, if it's a free scalar in four dimensions, right? OK. Um, I'm sorry, this is not for arbitrary d. This is whatever it is. This is uh, d minus 2 plus l in general. I'm sorry. OK, that was, I wrote down the 4D formula. I'm a 4D guy. OK, so this is the general formula. Um, but it's only for primary operators. You, you're still wondering, why am I not talking about other operators? And I'm about to tell you. Yes. OK. But it turns out it's actually for all. Ne never mind. You'll see. OK? OK, now, now I can actually explain to you why did I get to restrict to primary operators. OK? They, were, they are the things that have the simplest, represent, the simplest transformations under conformal transformations. But why don't I have to think about other operators? And the basic idea goes back to these commutation relations right here. OK? All right? So I can think of, if I have a primary operator at the origin, OK, the fact that d o is equal to delta o, right? I can read this equation as saying that the, that the, 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 the uh, dilatation generator acting on o at the origin is delta o, right? Because the commutators give a representation of the algebra. So I can just think of this as the product in the adjoint representation, OK? Now I can, I can see just from those commutation relations that if I take d, sorry, d of the operator p to the n o, right, I just apply n p's to o, and then I use this commutation relation here, what I see is that this p acts as a raising operator for the eigenvalue of d, right? And so this actually will be d plus n p 
to the n o of 0. I'm just going to, yeah, 0. I'll put the 0. OK? So p acts as a raising operator for the dimension. OK? And similarly, k, because it has the opposite thing, k to the n, OK? And, and by the way, this should not be, be anything shocking, because what is this? What is p n p's acting on o? It's n derivatives acting on o. OK? So this is saying the very obvious statement that if I start acting with derivatives on operators, I increase the dimension. OK? So this is something completely, you know, saying something you already know in a very mathematical way. But now, here's something you don't know, which is that if I take nk's acting on O, it has the opposite commutation relation with d. So k acts as a lowering operator. So this guy's dimension is delta minus n k to the n times O. OK? So now I can think about all of the operators that I get by starting with, uh, by, by, by acting with p's and k's, and you can show that even for non-primary operators, right, this is the case, right, that, uh, that, um, that, um, that, that, that p raises the dimension and k lowers the dimension, and now I can understand why there needs to be uh, why primary operators have to exist. If I can keep lowering, if I start with any operator, I can keep lowering the dimension forever unless there's some operator where k acting on O actually vanishes. Right? And that's kind of like a vacuum state. This is just like the vacuum state in a, in a simple harmonic oscillator. And then once I have that primary operator, I can actually act with p's and get a whole bunch of, 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 of guys with higher dimension. OK? So that means that arbitrary operators can be constructed out of these kinds of operators, which are the primary operators. OK? So that's why, you know, and those are the simplest operators. And then there are these operators here, which are just p's acting on the operators or derivatives acting on the operators. And those are called descendants. OK? And now you can understand why I'm never going to talk about descendants, because for example, if I know the correlation function of the primary operators is given by this that I've written down, I can easily find the correlation function of the descendants. I just take derivatives of this. It's just boring, right? OK? So I'm never going to talk about non-primary op- well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm I'm, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to. We're going to work with, with primary operators, yes. It is, but you're right that I haven't really shown it. I've given a sort of hand wavy argument here, okay? Because I've only shown you exactly what the formulas are for for primary operators, right? And for primary operators, they lower it like this. But what if there are no primary operators? Is there some other way? No. But I haven't. I agree that I haven't really shown it in detail here, okay? But it, it's it's I've given you the idea, but not the the exact detailed proof, okay? I don't have a good. I don't have a great intuition for that. I mean, the, you know, the harmonic oscillator is the best I can do. That's an algebraic intuition. <laughs> well, well, actually, I can. No, I, I can see it actually. So let me see. Where did? Oh, I erased it. Okay. So uh, if you remember this delta, what were the, what did the special conformal transformations look like? They looked like. Let me just write down one term. They looked like x squared b, right? So now you tell me, what's the dimension of b? What's the dimension of this parameter? Minus 1. It's dimensions of mass, right? So then b dot k is the generator. So what's the dimension of k? Minus 1 in mass units, right? It's, it's a length, OK? And so from that, it's clear that this operator has to have, this actually has to lower the dimension of the operator. So actually, this is pretty much just dimensional analysis. Yeah, I guess I should have said that. Yes? OK. All righty. So time's a ticking. There's a great saying by Victor Weisskopf, which is that it's, it's better to uncover a little than uh, cover a lot. So I'm going to try to uncover as much as I can. 
And uh, we'll just, I'll tell you, you know, I'll just do the best that I can, but I, I'm not going to speed up. OK, so three point functions. Let's keep going. We had complete success with uh, two point functions. So now let's look at three operators O1 of x1, O2 of x2, O3 of x3. OK? And what could it possibly look like? OK? Well, I claim that an ansatz which is general enough would be to have arbitrary powers x12 to the alpha, x23 uh, to the beta, x31 to the gamma, OK, with some coefficients, and then summing over all possible values of alpha, beta, and gamma, OK? So here, xij just means xi minus xj, OK? So if you, d you can do this a little bit more rigorously, but this, this, is, this is pretty clear, OK? And now, what does dilatation invariance tell us? Dilatation invariance tells us that the, both of these sides have the same dimensions, which is alpha plus beta plus gamma equals delta 1 plus delta 2 plus delta 3, right? That's OK. But that still leaves lots and lots of possibilities, OK? So what about special conformal transformations? Remember, there was that miraculous algebraic identity, right? That this thing right here transformed into a product of the denominators of x for x1 times the denominator for x2. And similarly for this one, and similarly for this one, right? So now I have three. And then over here, I just get the product of the three denominators, but in general with different powers, OK? So I get three additional relations by requiring that all of those that the x1s, the x2s, and the x3s, that those denominator powers all match up. Okay? And so what that turns out to be, those constraints, again, it's a very good exercise for you to check, that it tells you that alpha is delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3. I'm also taking into account this constraint. So I'm solving that constraint with that constraint. I'm just telling you what you get. And beta is delta 2 plus delta 3 minus delta 1, and gamma is delta 3 plus delta 1 minus delta 2. And if you're halfway good at pattern matching, you will see the pattern. OK? So what have I learned? I've learned that this three-point function, even the three-point functions, are uh, almost entirely determined. O1 of x1, O2 of x2, O3 of x3 is in fact equal to x12 to the delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3, x23 delta 2 plus delta 3 minus delta 1. And you can guess what's coming, delta 3 plus delta 1 minus delta 2. And all of that is over some constant, right, which can depend on which operators I'm talking about. OK? Now, I've already used my freedom in the two-point function to normalize the operators. So I don't have any more freedom left. I can't. This delta 1, 2, 3 is a genuine parameter of the theory, which I can't fix by symmetries. OK? And you can think of delta 1, so delta 1, so 1, 2, 3, you can think of it as something like a coupling constant, right? Right? Very, very roughly. Okay, it's some dimensionless number that tells you how big a three-point function is. It's not some coupling constant in the Lagrangian that I use to calculate things. It's the end result. It's kind of like when I define, we normalize things by saying that a physical thing is equal to a coupling constant. It's that kind of coupling constant, right? It's like a renormalized coupling constant. OK? All right, having had complete success with the three-point function, can anybody guess what we're going to do next? Let's look at the four-point function. Okay. And now for the four-point function, now we're finally running out of gas, OK? Because now you can actually, remember, the big constraint is this denominator constraint from the special conformal transformations. And you can actually easily check that if you have, you can take what are called cross ratios, xij, uh, xkl squared. So how does this transform? It transforms into a product of these factors, right? And so if I take a different permutation of these guys, it'll transform the same way. So x i k x uh, j l squared, for example. right? This combination is completely invariant 
under the full conformal group. Okay? But I need at least four different guys, right? I need at least four different points to make such cross ratios. So that's why I didn't worry about these before. The two point function and the three point function were completely fixed because there were no cross ratios that I, invariant cross ratios that I could make. But in the four point function case, let's just consider the case of four identical scalar primary operators, okay? This can be a, an arbitrary, this can be written as like this x12 to the 2 delta, x34 to the 2 delta, times an arbitrary function of two cross ratios u and v. You can form two independent cross ratios. Okay, and these are some standard formulas. I'm not gonna. This is some convention about what these are. Okay. All right. So now I have ten minutes left. Um. All right. I'm gonna. All I'm gonna be able to do is in ten minutes is tell you the basic idea behind how we can. Uh, how we can write down a set of algebraic equations that uh, determine everything in the conformal field theory, right? So how do we determine these functions? And we haven't even talked about higher point functions. What is the idea? <sighs> 10 minutes, huh? Let me think what I'm going to do here for a second. Mm. <laughs> okay. All right. So, quantization. We're thinking of this theory as being defined by a path integral. When we have a path integral, we can define states on an arbitrary slice, sigma. So, we can think of this as a time slice, right? Okay. And uh, we can define states by integrating over the past of this possibly with some operator insertions, right? And that defines some state here on this slice, OK? So I can define a state which is labeled by some local operator insertions by just performing a path integral with these operator insertions, OK? If I don't insert any operators, I just get the vacuum, OK? Now, in practice, we don't usually take weird floppy slices, although actually it turns out sometimes it is useful to do that. Generally, we're interested in slices that are related to each other by some isometry. So in other words, I could choose a family of slices, weird wiggly slices, and I could think about the theory, I could think about some time variable that labels which slice that I'm on, okay? And I could think of states on these slices evolving in quote unquote time. But the choice of time and the choice of these slices is arbitrary. But it's usually simplest to take uh, slices that are related by some symmetry of the theory. And of course, the example that you're familiar with are flat slices with x0 equals constant. Or I guess I'm saying x1 in my Euclidean space. OK? Right? But in conformal field theories or scale invariant theories, there's another very natural choice, which is that in here, in here, the Hamiltonian is just p0, right? The Hamiltonian that takes you from one slice to the other is p0. But in scale invariant theories, there's what turns out to be a much better choice, which is to take the, the, the surfaces sigma to be spheres, s d, mi uh, s, uh, d minus 1, right? OK? Uh, to be spheres, and now the Hamiltonian is just the dilatation operator. OK? Now, uh, okay, and now I can talk about the states on these slices. Okay, the states on this slice are these slices are defined by just doing the path integral over the inside. Okay, possibly with some operator insertions somewhere in the middle. Okay. So now notice that this pa a path integral always gives you a map from operators to states because for any set of operators that I insert on my, inside my surface, I define a state. So here I can define a state, O1, O2, for example, that lives on this sphere. Okay? And the amazing thing that is somehow only used in conformal field theory, but is actually also more general, is that the correspondence actually goes the other way. 
Okay? The correspondence actually goes the other way because uh, I can also, uh, uh, given any state, I can go the other way because given any state, psi on this, any state whatsoever, okay, I can evolve it backwards in time, backwards in radius. right? And what's going to happen? Nothing special until I get to the origin. Right? But at the origin, it will in general be singular. Okay? And the claim is that this state defines some operator, O psi, that lives at the origin. Okay? So there's a one to one map between states living on these spheres and operators living at the origin. It doesn't matter, OK? So that's what I'm going to say next. Five minutes to get through the rest of CFT. Not going to happen, OK? So uh, if I have two operators here, OK, what happens, OK? So that defines some state, O1, O2, OK? Now I pretend that I didn't know that this came from these operators, O1 and O2. And the claim is that this state still evolves back to the origin and define some local operator at the origin. Okay? So there it means that there are multiple ways of getting the same same state here. Okay? But this immediately implies that okay, O1, O2 is equal to some sum okay, of operators times coefficients times this operator acting on the vacuum. This operator inserted at zero. Okay? And this has to, in fact, hold as an operator relationship. I'm going to start at this point. I'm going to start making just assertions to try and get to the punchline. The assertion is that this implies that we must have an operator relation of this form, x1, x2, is a sum over operators c, uh, 1, 2, O, oh, what can it depend on? It can depend on x1 minus x2. It can depend on x1 plus x2. Okay? And then it's an operator evaluated at the origin. Okay? And this must be an equality. Okay? Now you're used to seeing equations like this uh, as an asymptotic limit when x1 approaches x2. That would be the OPE, the operator product expansion of Wilson. right? But the point is here is it holds as an exact operator identity. And heuristically, that makes sense because there's no scale in the theory. right? If it holds at arbitrarily small scales, well, all scales are the same. Okay, So that's one heuristic way of justifying it. What I've shown you over here is a more rigorous way of justifying it. Here, it is really the statement that any state in a Hilbert space can be expanded in some other basis. right? Okay. So now we can apply this to uh, four-point functions. Remember that two-point functions are completely determined if we know the dimensions. Three-point functions are completely determined if we know these numbers, lambda ij's, lambda ijk's. So the next frontier is four-point functions. And so if we have some, let's take four identical scalars, and I'm going to call them phi's, phi of x1, phi of x2, phi of x3, phi of x4, you should not think that phi is an elementary scalar. Phi is just some scalar operator. Okay? And now what I can do is I can use this uh, OPE to replace this by an infinite sum of operators, right? some infinite sum of O's. And this thing is some infinite sum of O's. right? So this reduces to a two-point function. But the, excuse me, the two-point functions, um, are diagonal, okay, in uh, uh, in operator space, right? And so I actually get I don't get a double sum, I just get a single sum, okay? And in fact, uh, I need to include in this sum both the primaries and the descendants, right? But the descendants are also just derivatives of the primaries, okay? So I can determine all of the descendants just in terms of the primaries. And so each of these terms will be proportional to uh, 
a three-point function, phi phi o squared, because I get one from here and one from here, okay? And the claim is that the rest of the function is completely kinematically determined, okay? So there is, it has the form, you can write it in this form, 2 delta phi, x3, 4, 2 delta phi, okay? And then there's some unknown function, g of u and v, okay? Sorry, g, sorry, not an unknown function, sorry. A known function, g sub o of u and v, okay? This function is known because it's, con it's fixed completely by conformal invariance. This is called, this thing right here is called a conformal block. Okay? And the important point is that it's kinematic. It's completely fixed by conformal invariance. Okay? I don't have time to explain it, but I'm hope trying to give you the idea. Okay? And now, I'm going to take three more minutes. I'm going to go over by a total of three minutes. So I'm sorry to delay your lunch. Okay? So, Okay, so I hope that was somewhat clear. But now the point is that I can also do this expansion in another channel. So I can do it, for example, in this channel. Okay, remember we're in Euclidean space, operators just not com commute through each other. Okay, so uh, I'm do I do this channel and I get an expansion of exactly the same form. I have the same operators appearing. Okay, but now I have a different function right here, x uh, 2 3 to the 2 delta, x uh, 1 4 to the 2 delta, but I have these same known functions, and now this is v u. Okay, so I haven't defined the v's and the u's, they're just some cross ratios. Okay, there are some ratios of the x i j's squared such that this is the case. Okay, but now these two things have to be the same, right? Because I'm just writing the, I'm using this OPE in two different channels, they have to agree. Okay? So I can view this as a set of equations in what are the unknowns? The unknowns in these equations are the deltas, the dimensions of all the operators, okay? And these lambdas, right? There's no other input to, to these equations, okay? Now, what you can see is that I could repeat this story for higher point functions, right? For higher point functions, I could repeat this example. I could calculate any higher correlation functions in terms of the deltas and the lambdas. So if I knew all of these guys, I would know everything about the theory, or at least I could recursively calculate all the correlation functions. So this right here is called the CFT data. Okay? Knowing this determines every correlation function of the CFT. This equals that is an infinite, this is an infinite amount of data, right? It's an infinite amount of operators, so it's a huge, huge set of data. But this is also an infinite number of equations, because it has to be true at every single point. So it's a you know, continuous infinity of equations. So it's highly non-trivial that there should be any solutions at all. Okay. Of course, we know the examples where we know there are solutions, so we know there are special cases where there are solutions. But basically, the bootstrap program is the program of directly attacking these equations. Okay. And it's had some really uh, great successes. Um, and I think I am just going to quit, okay, because I believe in staying on time. And I'll be happy to talk more about this uh, with you privately. Okay. Thanks. So I'll just stick around if people want to come up and ask questions. Yeah, so.